Hi, this is Bruce from Nozomi. Thank you for joining us. Um, today we're going to be talking about threat detection. You know, and as you, if you've been watching these series of videos, you know that I like to go through and talk to various experts in the field to get a little bit more insight on certain topics in security today. So today we've got Roya Gordon, who's from our threat research team, uh, joining us. So Roya, uh, can you give a quick intro about who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So. My name is Roya Gordon and I'm on the security research team here at Nozomi. And what's cool about our team is that not only do we do threat intelligence and threat detection, but we try to find zero day vulnerabilities in a lot of industrial control systems and IoT devices and then work with vendors on securing them. So um, I've been in the OT and ICS space for about five, six years, have a background studying cyber warfare and did threat intelligence in the military. So I'm happy to be here. Great, thanks. Yeah, so we're gonna, you know, a couple things come to mind when, you know, we think about threat detection. Um, really, I think, let's get started just from a very basic level. Like, what are the sort of threats that our threat research team is out there looking for, or any just threat researchers in general in the OT space? Okay, so let's start with vulnerabilities. There's um, two main things I wanna highlight when it comes to vulnerabilities. You have your zero days, so those are the vulnerabilities that aren't known to the vendor or the asset owner. So research teams like our team, we, we find these zero days, we work with the vendor to find patches, we work with the government to put out these advisories um, so that we're kind of catching it before the attacker does. The other part of it is end day vulnerabilities. These are the vulnerabilities that are already announced, but there's a delay when it comes to the asset owner patching it. And it's known that there's uh, several nation state threat actors that actively go after these vulnerabilities, sometimes five years after the patch is released, because they understand that not everyone gets around to patching, people get used to implementing workarounds. So I would say um, vulnerabilities and patching, that's one part of it. Um, another part of threat detection, you know, they're the IOCs, the indicators of compromise associated with threat actors and their tools. So URLs, malicious IP addresses, file hashes, email addresses. Um, if you know that these are associated with malicious activity, malicious tools and different threat actors, then not only should you be blocking it from your network, but you can also set up honeypots so you can hunt for it as well. Yeah, you brought up a good point where you talk about uh, patching, right? I think when there's really kind of two areas of thought, right, or two areas of practice. You know, I have, a lot of my background is in, in IT security, and I've been doing OT security for about 10 years now. Uh, but traditional IT security, if a zero-day vulnerability comes out, odds are you can probably get a, a patch out, you can get updates done pretty quickly. But if you're dealing with OT, or if you're even just standard IoT, um, one, from an OT perspective, you mentioned that you know you may have a long maintenance window, right? Where you maybe the system can only be down once every 24 months or something like that. Um, and then you all, so you run into a lot of issues where you can't necessarily put a patch out. So you have to rely on these mitigation factors, right? So there is, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot to be said for the awareness, right? Because a lot of these mitigation factors, like you know, setting up firewall rules or, you know, just doing continuous monitoring really rely very heavily on knowing what to monitor for, right? And so you talk about indicators of compromise. Um, that's a really important thing, especially I think for OT and IOT um, security, because we can't always patch, right? It's not always something that you can go out and do a quick fix for. Um, yeah. There's no fix. Like sometimes there's not going to be a fix, right? There may be a vulnerability that requires an update, but the system that you're running can't be updated because you're using a function that would be degraded by upgrading it, right? Or, or, or something. There's always some weird issue that yeah. leads or to not be able to legacy patch. Legacy systems, you know. So obviously, with um, oil and gas facilities or utilities, they have a lot of remote assets and if that system is no longer supported um they're not going to just rip it out and then replace it they're just going to kind of keep using it until it dies so that's also been like a huge issue when it comes to legacy systems um but again 
you know, we try to help with um, vulnerability um, management and prioritization. So maybe not just patch everything that comes out, but look at that CVSS score and see which are the ones that are the most critical. Um, you might want to try to squeeze that in, you know, outside of maintenance schedules. And then also, which are the ones that are actively actively being exploited by threat actors? So if you know that threat actors are after this vulnerability, then waiting 24 months, I mean, you're already probably going to be happy. So um, I think, you know, as I've been working more with different customers and clients, you know, in the critical infrastructure space, I've been seeing the need for vulnerability management. So um, so it's not so overwhelming because the answer isn't to just not patch because we can't afford the downtime. It's like we need to prioritize what we need to patch right away. Yeah. And prioritization is extremely important, right? Because you know, you look at traditional models of, you know, de determining how critical a system is, right? I mean, the, there's the old Purdue model, right, which is used kind of as a basis for a lot of OT models uh, that say, okay, well, everything is at a certain level of, of security, right? Well, that may not necessarily be what's right for your, for your business, right? So one of the things that I often would do um, from a consultation perspective is go in and say, okay, well, well here's all the systems you have that we've discovered. Um, what are the ones that are most critical? What are the ones that your business can't go without, right? And those are the ones that have to be prioritized, right? Because to your point, there may be, you know, you may look at the systems in your, in your network and you say 75% of them have some vulnerability that need to be patched right away, right? Or, or, or you know, that, that are yeah. very important. But then, okay, out of that 75%, what are the ones that I really need to get to right now, right? And so, yeah prioritization is extremely important um, and that's why it's so important to get that good information where you know from you know the, the threat research right to see how severe the attack is what are the kind of the, the consequences of not patching and then figure out where are your critical systems and your critical assets that you need to go in and actually apply any sort of uh, mitigation or, or patching strategy too. Yeah, I do want to add something right here. So um, with our Threat Intel program, we're all about sharing Threat Intel with partners to, to make sure that we have a more robust um, threat detection, that we're protecting customers because we can't see everything. So we're leveraging partners to get that additional intel. Um, one of the things that we're focusing on now is having visibility into the dark web, seeing what vulnerabilities threat actors are talking about because a lot of the the uh, cyber attacks that have occurred, um, you kind of see that activity going on on the dark web before it even hits the big news. So focusing on what's on the dark web, what are the vulnerabilities and the devices threat actors are interested in, and then that can kind of tie into the vulnerability management. So I'm really excited to see how this capability builds out in the future and how we can help everyone continue to prioritize patching in um, process control environments. That's great. You know, and you, you talked about uh, detection, right? Or so looking at, you know, finding threats on the dark web or what are, what are some of the the methods that we use or that vulnerability researchers in general use to detect these new threats? So honeypots. <laughs> this is why I'm so excited about our threat report um, because we created a, a, a several honeypots that's um, made to look like a vulnerable system and we're able to catch attackers trying to access the system. And in doing so, we're able to collect information such as IP addresses they're using, what are, what are some commands that they're automating. Um, and then with collecting that information from a honeypot, we're able to tell the industry, hey, we know this is what these um, botnets are packed with. So in turn, you can go ahead and secure your network. So, you know, hacking these fake networks so that we can protect the real networks. That's excellent. Excellent. You know, and, you know, some of the things that, you know, it's, it's, it's not only just on the researchers, I think, to, to detect these threats, right? You mentioned community, right? I think there are, there are a lot of threats that, you know, let's say we've got honeypots spread around 60% of the globe or 70 or, or whatever the number is, right? Um, well, what about that other percentage that's not covered, right? Or what about, you know, the, the, the attacker that doesn't 
doesn't come in on the hunt, on the honeypot, right? So that's where I think it's really important from a community perspective to be able to, you know, folks to be able to actively collect information about new threats or, you know, collect new attacks that are coming in, you know, so you can start seeing where those malicious IP addresses are coming from and, and, and that sort of thing, right? So it is, you know, you, you talked about community, and I think that's extremely important, right? Because there, you, you can't have one one organization collecting all of the threats or finding all the threats, it's, it's unrealistic, right? So community is, is huge. Yeah, I f feel like everyone has their role. So the vendors, you know, they need to patch, they need to make sure that their software is continuously updated. Um, security researchers were just constantly trying to see, hmm, how would a threat actor hack this device? And then, you know, we again report it to the vendor so that they can patch it. Then you have the, um, the dark web, researchers so they're looking at those unknown or not so obvious threats so that they can provide insights into further securing networks then you have people that um they just track threat groups tools they reverse um engineer them to get a better understanding you know so like what we did with um Indestroyer 2 we're able to look at the source code and say hey the original Indestroyer is actually a broader framework where Indestroyer 2 was built but then it could lead to different variants of Indestroyer so maybe Indestroyer 3 Indestroyer 4 so everyone kind of has their role into kind of helping the broader community um, become more secure. So it's definitely so a community you, effort. <laughs> so you mentioned in Destroyer too. Um, you know, what are some of the, the threats that you we've been seeing, you know, kind of some of the major threats that we've been seeing in the past, you know, past half year or past year or, or what have you? Yep. So. Um, because of the Russia-Ukraine war, we started to see a lot of cyber war-related tools and threat actors at play. So ransomware has been around for a while. I don't think ransomware is going away, but you kind of see the difference between financially motivated threat actors and then um, advanced persistent threats or nation state threat actors that want to be more destructive. So we've been seeing a use of my wiper malware. So with ransomware where it's like, hey, we're going to lock up your data and force you to pay the ransom so we can you know, give you access. Wiper malware, they're just trying to destroy all of your data. There's no way to get it back. And that's a tactic that destructive threat actors use because it's a war tactic. So we kind of saw ransomware, we saw um, you know, advanced persistent threats, and then we even saw hacktivism because again, now there's a divide with the threat actors supporting Ukraine, supporting Russia. So lots of activity on that front. We saw the emergence of industrial control systems, um, specific malware, so in controller and in destroyer too, those um, types of malware, they rear their ugly head again during these times where, you know, um, threat actors are trying to be disruptive and destructive and not necessarily after financial gain. Um, and we definitely saw, you know, again, new threat groups. Whenever we see a threat group with a new tactic, it then becomes a trend. So when a threat group, they decided to start using name and shame coupled with ransomware, we then started to see all threat actors now use name and shame when they're doing ransomware. So with this new um, lapses threat group, they're monetizing data breaches. So instead of um, having ransomware and deploying it on the network, they're just saying, hey, we're gonna steal your data and we're gonna post it on this name and shame site until you pay us to stop. So now it's like, hmm, let's kind of see the next six months how threat actors take this and run with it because that's, that's what we tend to see. So um, a lot of interesting activity. Again, so many threat actors at play, advanced persistent threats, hacktivists, financially motivated threat actors, there's wiper malware, um, there's data breaches being monetized, and then there's ICS um, malware in the, the ecosystem right now. So let's take a step back and maybe detail a little bit on some of the the, the terms that you used, right? Because the you know I I'm, I often realize that as I'm discussing with other people in the industry that we use a lot of jargon, right? And we use a lot of terms that everybody knows. Um, so can you can you expand on or maybe double click on name and shame? Just explain what that is for for folks that may not be familiar with it. Okay, so name and shame. Um, it means that the threat actor, not only did they steal, um, it could be intellectual property, personally identifiable information, trade secrets, whatever. When they get into the network, they steal that, and then they're gonna post it on a website 
for other threat actors to have access to. And again, this is sensitive information. So um, it's embarrassing, which is why they call it name and shame, because now everyone knows that, you know, you're the victim of a cyber attack. But then now there's other threat actors that could have access to this information that could do other things with it. And they do this because, especially if it's like trade secrets, um, companies, they don't want that information out. So they're gonna say, okay, hold on now. We're, we'll give you whatever you want. Just please stop sharing this information publicly. Now, the downside of that is you don't ever wanna negotiate with a threat actor because they're gonna sell it anyway. <laughs> um, so with ransomware, when there's companies that negotiate, you know, yeah, you have access to your data, but they've already made copies of it and they're selling it on the dark web. So they're kind of doubling their efforts um, so yeah, never, never feel like you need to negotiate, just kind of cut it as a loss. But then also there's things that you can do to make sure that the loss of data and information doesn't affect operations, which is why having strong backups is key. Whether it's ransomware, whether it's wiper malware, if you don't have strong backups, then um, for lack of a better term, you're going to be screwed. So, but yeah, name and shame has definitely become a very powerful tactic threat actors are using because again, they're trying to pressure that victim to pay a fine, pay a ransom. And it's it's been pretty lucrative in its work. So whenever there's something that works, threat actors, they continue to use it. Yeah, we see that a lot where, you know, and, and historically you've seen, you know, I mean, that's why ransomware is so popular right now, right? Because And it's probably, to your point, it's never going away. I don't, I, I think ransomware is, it's, it's a fairly easily lucrative type of attack. Um, and I think it's one of those that, you know, now that it's now that some everybody's doing it right. Um, and we, we saw trends like this, you know, for example, it used to be that hospitals and, and healthcare was kind of off limits from the hacking perspective. But then there was the ransomware incident at the hospital in, in Hollywood, what, six, seven years ago. And then now suddenly, hospitals are, are fair game, right, uh, from a yeah. hacking perspective. So it's interesting to see once somebody does it where they, you know, the, the threat gets picked up and continued, right? Um, how much of that do you think is, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this uh, appropriately, but how much of that is, do you think is because it's, uh, the, the groundwork's already been established and it's easier to just pick up something that, that somebody's already done all the hard work to develop first and then go and, and use that as a thread? I, I think it's more um, the fact that um, threat actors realize where the lucrative industries are that depend on critical information for operations. So if there's a ransomware attack at a hospital, you know, you can't do surgeries, patient data is locked up, you can't provide care, and you're gonna be more desperate to get your data back and thus pay the ransom. So that's kind of why we saw that being a target. I know there's been schools that's been a target. There are um, a lot of local governments, and they are so behind when it comes to cybersecurity. You know, they're dealing with public funds. They can't have the latest and greatest technology. There's a short of a, a personnel. So um, the public health and the public sector, it just becomes like a breeding ground or like a, an attractive target get for threat actors. Um, so we also saw that in the, the ICS or the critical infrastructure industry, especially after Colonial Pipeline, because threat actors weren't trying to be disrupt disruptive. They were financially motivated, but they realized, man, these, you know, um, these industries, they need this data to operate. And if we disrupt that, then they're going to pay the ransom. So um, when that ransom was paid, we saw another ransomware attack on a manufacturing facility. And even this year alone in our threat report, we show a timeline of so many different attacks on critical infrastructure. Because again, threat actors realize they need data or they're gonna shut down a pipeline or they're gonna lose money and they have the money to pay millions of dollars. That's another thing. They're not gonna do a ransomware attack on a mom and pop or like a, a small uh, firm. They're gonna, you, they're gonna do it on companies that can afford to pay $4 million in ransom. So I think they look at who has the most low hanging fruit um, who has data that's that's critical for their operations, and then who has the money to pay us millions in ransom? Because again, the ransom keeps getting higher and higher. Before it would be like a hundred k, and now they're they're asking for millions, which is is pretty alarming. But they're only doing it because they know that you know a company in um, in critical infrastructure can pay that in a blink of an eye and and not miss it. Right. You think about the Colonial Pipeline and how much they were losing per hour 
right? Yeah. It would, it would not being able to bill out because the systems were shut down. Um, it's it's an easy it's an easy math equation to to figure out, right? If I can yeah. if I'm going to be losing four million dollars per hour or per day or whatever, and the ransomware is a, a million or one point two, or it's going to take me you know a week to get back up and up and running. Um, that that's math that's that's pretty straightforward. Um, it's yeah. it, it's interesting to see because there there has been this kind of growth in ransomware where to your point it actually did start earlier in the mom and pops right so so SMB like the small medium business was really heavily hit um, because a lot of them had you know maybe didn't have the resources in place to have backups or have good security etc okay. um, and I think that was kind of the test ground. Right. And so there was there was a, a good couple of years where not good, but a, a, a couple of years where the, the small and medium businesses were the ones dealing with the brunt of ransomware. And then it kind of escalated. Right. And then once we once the threat actors saw that they could make more money by going against bigger targets, yeah. um, they became elephant hunters. Right. Instead of, you know, trying to in, in, instead of net fishing with nets, you know, they were now just going after one big target instead of trying to co collect a bunch of them. Um, so it's it's been an interesting thing to see that develop and see what it's doing over in the in the industrial side. Um, yeah. But to your point, you know, if we talk about, I mean, it would we can't really have a discussion about cybersecurity and NOT uh, at this time without talking about the the Russia Ukraine war. Um, and I think you know, to your point, we're seeing a lot of change from ransomware into more destructive destructive malware. Um, now, do you see that kind of, do you see efforts being focused more on the Russia-Ukraine side or do you, do you, we, are we still seeing a level of threat actors going, going against targets all over the world or has it been kind of focused more around Russia and Ukraine? It's definitely been more focused around the war. So in our threat report, we have a timeline of events that's happened from January to June of this year. And more than half of them, it's Russian based threat actors or this happened to Ukraine's grid and um, Russian backed. And so we we're starting to see a lot of activity that seems to be linked to the Russia-Ukraine war. And even um, we're tracking malicious IP addresses. So, you know, over the course of six months, what are unique malicious IP addresses that um, that we're catching with our honeypots? And when we show the line graph, there's a significant spike from January to February. And, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine in February. So it's, it's an interesting correlation. Like, hmm, now we see this spike. And ever since then, it's been fluctuating on the high. It hasn't dropped back down to normal volumes that we saw at the end of last year or until January, um, January before the invasion. So um, we have all these indications to show, yeah, it, it seems like the war, and it, it makes sense. Um, a lot of threat actors, um, sophisticated threat actors, are Russian-based, and again, there are nuances, you know, um, Russian-based, Russian-speaking, or backed by Russia. But during wartime, what happens is Russia, they tend to leverage other threat groups that maybe weren't traditionally advanced persistent threats, but they have capabilities, so they may leverage financially motivated threat actors or other types of independent hacker groups to kind of carry out their attacks, obviously to kind of, so that they can say, hey, no, we had nothing to do with it. Um, but but yeah, definitely within this current landscape, I would say it's it's very focused on cyber war. And we tend to see this even um, um, a couple years ago with Iran and um, the sanctions being enforced. And there was a lot of um, retaliatory attacks. Anytime there's like a foreign policy change, then we start to see a ramp up of Iranian cyber threat activity. So this isn't um, abnormal from what we're seeing. And we expect to continue to see um, different types of threat groups and tactics on the rise whenever there's a type of cyber war for a po foreign policy change or regional tensions. And, it, and it's interesting because when there is, you know, we, we think about cyber war and I think, you know, most people, the, the first thought is, okay, well, I, it, I'm, not the, I'm not Ukraine, so I don't have to worry about it. But I think there's a lot of fallout going around, you know, for example, I read in the report about the, the Viasat uh, being attacked and that that causing issues in with wind turbines in Germany, right? And so yeah. there's all of these kind of um, repercussions or, or these echoes that, that go through through across the globe because of these activities that are going on around a, a, you know a cyber war. 
Yeah. And also because, you know, everyone's using the same devices, like the market isn't that big. So even if there is a utility in Ukraine that got attacked, well, I'm sure there's utilities in the United States and just in other places that use those same devices and, you know, threat actors will target it the same way. And that's why um, whenever there's, you know, attacks on power grid and assets abroad, no matter where you are, you should kind of take um, take heed. It could mean that, you know, now maybe your assets are going to be targeted, you know, or you could be caught in the crossfires. You know, if you have assets that are in the Middle East and there's conflict there, then, you know, you might be at risk, maybe not as a primary target, but again, caught in those crossfires. And sometimes threat actors, they tend to target companies that are in support of their enemy too. And even though, you know, you're just an independent company, you know, they're associating, if it's American based or if it's, you know, whatever um, country that your headquarters are in, they're kind of associating you with that country. So although, you know, um, oil and gas or energy companies could be global, there is that association with, oh, you're American, um, we're gonna target you now because you have facilities in these countries. So yeah, it doesn't matter where the attack is. I think everyone should be terrified and everyone, not only terrified, but they should act, they should learn, they should know how to protect their systems in case they're hit. So you mentioned earlier uh, about backups, right? And talking about things that people can do as kind of a recovery if there's an issue, right? So what are some other tips that you can give to folks out there um, to better prepare for for these these new new wave of threats that are coming out? Yeah, so with backups, that needs to be a whole policy within itself. Um, you need to understand how old does my data can my how you have to understand how old can my data be for me to still be operational or at least up to 95 percent operational in the event of a ransomware attack or like a wiper attack so maybe you can do backups every month every two months and if you're hit with an attack you can pull from those old backups and you'll be fine maybe you need a backup every week because um your environment just depends on the latest greatest data to where you can't afford to pull from six months old data so just kind of understanding how your environment functions your what kind of data you need and then backing up regularly because you don't want to keep those backups online that defeats the purpose because again if there's an attack it's going to spread to your backup so it needs to be a, a um, it needs to be done intermittently so yeah this tuesdays every tuesday we do backups and then we we make sure it's offline and we do backups again so that's a good strategy um i would also say you know asset inventory you know we've been hearing that term but you know i've been in this industry for you know six plus years and it never fails when we're going on site to electric utility company and they just don't know what they have at all so um, just kind of understanding what you have because if there's a vulnerability in a device and you have it at a substation somewhere, you don't even know that you have it, you're, you're just low hanging fruit. And again, threat actors, they, um, they don't manually try to target companies, they use botnets. So they're gonna send out hundreds at a time and it's gonna go and find low hanging fruit. And then if that system is in a substation somewhere in the middle of nowhere, now that's an access vector for threat actors. So understanding what devices you have in each you know, site, that's key. Um, and then being able to monitor that environment. I feel like we have the IT down packed. We're able to see anomalous behavior, who's accessing this system that isn't supposed to access it. Um, but in OT environments, it's very difficult. No one knows what anything looks like, what anomalous behavior is, if devices are supposed to be talking to each other or not. Um, they just know that it works, it functions, and you know the, the production is happening. So I think um, just kind of changing the mindset of cybersecurity in OT environments is key. And knowing, hey, we need to know what we have, if they're supposed to be talking to each other or not, knowing what we need to patch. Um, it helps with prioritization of patching vulnerabilities. So um, yeah, so those are kind of some of the things I would say kind of need to be implemented when um, trying to protect OT environments. That's a, I mean, it's a great list. And I think about, you know, obviously from a backups perspective, you know, you may need to make sure that you have multiple, keep multiple iterations offline, right? So because yeah. that's always the issue with an advanced persistent threat is that it may already be resident 
in your backup, right? So, yeah. you know, you need to have multiple, you know, multiple backups kept offline um, so that, you know, in case, you know, it, that would be the worst thing. Let's say you take a backup on Tuesday and then, you know, the ransomware was implanted on Monday, right? And then now you've got a backup of that ransomware and, you know, and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> so it's important to make sure that you keep those, those multiple iterations online. Um, also, thinking about asset inventory, right? And knowing what's out there, I think that's extremely important, right? Because to your point, if you don't know you have a, a vulnerable asset sitting here in, in your environment, that could be a jumping point for a threat actor to come in and, and infect the rest of your, your network. And I think yeah. that's, that's an extremely important thing as well. And really monitoring becomes really huge, I think in OT and IOT, right? Because from a traditional IT perspective, you've got technologies like MDR and XDR and you know next generation firewalls, things that can actively block, right? They see a threat coming across the line and they just say, okay, I'm not allowing that, that packet. Uh, but on an OT side, you can't necessarily do that, right? Because you know you may have processes that that have to run, or you may be block, you know, accidentally blocking a, a safety information system, right? That you know because it's it's doing something that may look suspicious. You don't want to you know potentially block that. So that's where I think on OT and IoT side, it becomes extremely important to spend more time on doing that twenty four by seven monitoring to look yeah. for new threats and look for new issues which is part of why what the security research team does is so important, right? Because if you've got somebody that's sitting there, you know, eyes on glass 24 by seven, um, you need to know what to look for, right? You can't yeah. be expecting every analyst or every person that's, that's monitoring the SOC to be a level three analyst that can say, oh, I know these 16 things that are happening right now mean it's this attack, right? Um, yep. we, you can't expect that, right? And so that's why it's important for people to go out, you know, threat researchers, the, the community itself to go out and identify these zero days so that it can make it easier for the security staff who's already short staffed, right, to be able to respond more quickly. Yeah, I, I do want to add to that. Um, what's going to make detection more difficult and, you know, um, incident response more difficult is what's called living off the land. And that's a new technique that we've been seeing threat actors use where they obfuscate their activity in legitimate processes on the network. So it doesn't alert. I think that as we continue the next six months, that's gonna be something to monitor because that could help inform and possibly change how we do detection. So instead of just saying this is, um, uh, regular or normal behavior, there needs to be ways to say, well, if they're a threat actor is masking their behavior in this legitimate behavior, what does that look like? So, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm really excited to kind of see, you know, that level of granularity when it comes to security, because we we're always behind. We're always kind of reactive. The threat actor does something and then now we're trying to catch up. So it's kind of good to stay ahead and say, okay, we know that this is the direction they're going in. Let's take it a step further and already try to predict how, um, what loopholes we're going to be able to find in this living off the land technique that threat actors are using. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You talk about, you know, kind of subverting legitimate processes, right? And that's where that kind of behavioral anomaly comes into play, right? Because let's say, you know, you've got Netcat running in your environment and that's a legitimate process, but if it's doing something that's weird, you need to be able to determine that, right? And so that's where technologies like Nozomi and and others can look at that that anomalous behavior and say, hey, look, that's I know this is a known process, but it's never communicated to this system and it's also communicating to some IP address in in the Middle East or in China or, or whatever. Um, so that's why that being able to determine that anomalous behavior becomes extremely important, right? So you know, it's not only just the detection of known threats, it's also that piecing together and trying to give you a little bit of a, basically like your, your, your mini researcher in a box, right? To say, okay, yeah. this, this all looks weird. Let's take a little bit further uh, study of it, right? Yeah. So Roya, thank you. This has been a really great conversation. Before we wrap though, I do want to bring back uh, around to the, the latest threat report. Um, was there anything in your mind that really stood out to you about the threat report? Yes, so we do talk about 
Russia, Ukraine and the cyber war insights. So um, very good information there to kind of learn about threat actors and the tools that they're using and, you know, uh, in controller industry or two. But I would say the meat and potatoes of this report um, is the IoT botnet landscape. So we set up a series of honeypots that's uh, attracting the IoT botnets that threat actors use so that we can um, obtain metrics. You know, So what are the IP addresses associated with these botnets? What are the commands that they're trying to execute? What are the locations? You know, What countries are these botnets coming from? And um, we have a lot of those insights that I think the industry can use to help protect their network. So if you know that threat actors are using default credentials to access devices, then maybe you, know, you need to make sure you change the default passwords on your devices. Um, if you know that this IP address is trying to access our honeypots 25,000 times, then maybe we should block those IP addresses. Um, if we know that threat actors are trying to execute these commands when in the network, then maybe we need to kind of pay attention to these commands and dig a little bit deeper into what this means, why are threat actors trying to um, use these commands to escalate privilege, to set up command and control, to move laterally. So that section is very insightful. Another insightful section is our analysis on the ICS cert advisories. Just taking a look at how many have been reported and comparing it to last year. So are we seeing an increase in reporting, a decrease in reporting? Um, what we saw that was very interesting is that Although the reporting has decreased, there are more vendors and more products that are vulnerable. So it kind of has us looking into market research, like what does this mean? Does it mean that there are more vendors? Does it mean that the existing vendors are putting out more products? So thus there's more products that are vulnerable. Does it mean that there's more security research teams that are trying to find vulnerabilities? Um, and then we have a list of the top industries that are affected by these advisories. So manufacturing is still leading. And that could be because they there's a lot of IoT and different technologies in manufacturing environments. So it could open up a lot more access vectors. Um, the second industry is energy. And then the third industry that's most affected by the ICS uh, vulnerability or ICS advisories are healthcare and commercial facilities. So lots of great insights in the report. We do some forecasting to say, hey, this is what you should prepare for in the next six months. We do provide remediations. Um, most of what we talked about with backups and threat intel. Um, we talk a little bit about the importance of SBOMs, Software Bill of Materials. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this report and I, I can't wait for uh, to get the feedback from the industry. Great, great. Thank you, Roy. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us today. Yep, thanks, Bruce. So thank you for joining us. I uh, hope you got a lot out of the discussion. I know I did. Um, you know, please, you know, look around the rest of our channel to see more videos like this on different topics. Uh, you know, we've got more coming out as well. And make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can see when we have new videos coming out. Mm -hmm.